Welcome, I'm Sabine Roman, and I will be presenting work that me and my collaborators developed on opinion dynamics. Many models have been designed to explain how opinions and behaviors change and vary across society. Roughly speaking, these studies are based on two main mechanisms. We have models based on structural heterogeneities, so differences in the relations between individuals and network structures lead to people being exposed to different sets of information. On the other hand, we have models based on homophily, here the causality is the other way around. People tend to interact with others that are similar and are influenced only by those they identify with. We looked at the third mechanism driving differences that Goldberg and Stein introduced, namely one based on associations and interpretation. This model implements a type of diffusion mechanisms for the associations between behaviors. We next detail the specifics of the model. In the model, agents have their own association matrix, which represents how their behaviors are associated. Agents also have a preference vector, representing the agent's like or dislike for certain behaviors. Now, the goal of each agent is to decrease cognitive dissonance. If an agent feels strongly about behavior I and believes behavior I is strongly associated to behavior J, he must also feel strongly about behavior J as well. This is implemented in the model by a constraint satisfaction formula, which will be one aspect that we modify. Very shortly, the model works as follows. Initialize a population with random preferences and uniform associations. Select two agents, A and B, randomly. A then displays two behaviors, I and J, and B observes this. As a result, B doesn't necessarily change his preference, but he does immediately update his associations between I and J. Then B selects the weakest of I and J behaviors and changes his opinion on this behavior if this decreases cognitive dissonance. In the end, we see that all agents agree on how behaviors are associated. But we also have polarization. Two types of agents emerge, one with a certain set of beliefs and another with directly opposed beliefs. We then understand why associative diffusion always leads to polarization, specifically into two groups. So we went to the, to the, into the details of the constraint implementation and we find a threshold of 50%. If two behaviors are associated more than 50%, the constraint pushes these to become maximally similar. If less than 50%, the constraint makes these behaviors become completely dissimilar. In a way, the constraint is creating a synthetic negative association for behavior associated less than 50%. And the constraint always allows for two maximum opposed solutions. Here we see an example of the association matrix and two probability vectors of preferences. Both the preference vectors are in accordance with the association matrix and we clearly see that 50% threshold in action. Now we adjusted the constraint function to do what it was likely intended to do. Namely, that positive associations push behaviors to have the same strength. In this case, we find no more polarization. Instead, all agents agree, and they exhibit each behavior equally likely. We ask if associative diffusion drives polarization. The model says yes, but we found this is solely due to constraint implementation. We therefore suggest that we need another framework that allows for negative associations, more explicitly. As a further extension, we propose an energy-based model where agents have a certain mental energy that considers the mental cost of having certain behaviors and certain associations. In this framework, we reformulate the cognitive distance reduction constraint as an energy minimization problem. This also gives us a consistent way of computing the probability of displaying a pair of behaviors by using Boltzmann weights. We ran some preliminary simulations with this model, and we find that yields a much richer diversity of patterns. The plots show the cosine similarity of the preference vectors for each pair of agents, with 30 agents in total. These preliminary results show that we do not necessarily get the two clusters polarization of Goldberg and Stein. We can have one cluster when associations are positive, or two or three clusters when we allow the associations to also be negative. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joana Gonçalves-Tsan and today I hope to convince you that we can use the craziness of pandemics like the one we're living through now 
to improve uh, now casting of seasonal diseases and to learn about human behavior. And the idea is that when we feel sick or when we feel the symptoms of some disease, more often than not, before going to the doctor, we go to Dr. Google, meaning that we Google those symptoms or we Google uh, the, the, the disease and the interest in the disease. So Google thought that this could be used to predict uh, the diseases and to do forecasting or now casting of diseases. And what Google used was an algorithm that aggregated a lot of search terms, called it Google, related to the flu, called it Google Flu Trends, and used it to do now casting of flu in the United States and then in different countries. That's the orange line, that's the uh, algorithm of Google. And then in blue, you see the actual number of cases in the United States from 2000, late 2009 to 2013. And this algorithm failed twice. It failed first in the 2009 pandemic, flu pandemic, and then again during the seasonal influenza of 2013. And if in the pandemic people kind of cut Google a break because it's a pandemic and it's so crazy, the scientists and the population in general really gave Google, Google a hard time in 2013 and called it an epic failure. The fact that they had grossly overestimated the number of cases. And the truth is there are many reasons why people would search for uh, diseases or symptoms online. It can be because they are sick, but it can also be because they are curious, because they are afraid, or just because the media mentions it a lot. And indeed, if we look back at 2009, the number, this is the, in orange, you see the number of cases for the, the, this uh, pandemic H1N1 influenza. And in pink, you see the search terms for flu. And they peak, the, this is all normalized, but they peak not when the case is peaked but they pick when the WHO declared the pandemic. And that's also when the news, or the frequency of news mentioning H1N1 and flu peaked as well. So, but if we could distinguish the terms that people use when they are sick, when the disease is happening, from the terms that they use when we have a, a pandemic going on or when they are afraid or when the media, media mentions it a lot, we could improve our signal to noise ratio. And this was the idea behind what Sarah and Claudio did. They searched for many different terms related with the flu, and here they are. Then they clustered them, and they found that some search terms correlated very strongly with the flu cases, while others correlated very strongly with the frequency of news uh, about the flu. And if this is the case, our prediction would be that the cases that correlate very strongly, the, the searches that correlate very strongly with the terms would be better at predicting seasonal influenza. And when Sarah trained them on either a linear regression or a random forest on the data from 2009 to 2013, 14, and then tested it on the following seasons, what she found was that using only the data from this cluster that correlated very strongly with the cases, the orange cluster, was much better, really minimized the error, compared to when she used all the data, all the data combined all of those search terms in both, in both systems. So curating the data, identifying this was improved forecasting, even when we're using a pandemic setting for a seasonal setting. So can we do the same thing for COVID? Sarah again collected all of the data now from Spain, because it already has two, very, two, uh, two waves. And again here in the orange you see the number of cases, in pink the search terms for COVID, and in blue the media mentions to the pandemic. And well, again, Sarah clustered this into these three different groups. And again, she found that there is one cluster that correlates pretty strongly with the number of cases. And she asked if these terms would be better if we trained on the first wave to predict the second wave. And indeed, that's what she found. She found that using only the terms, the orange terms from the orange cluster was much better and much more consistent than using all of the data combined or the data from cluster two or cluster three, both in a linear regression and in a random forest. So overall, I believe to have shown you that we've developed a tool that can improve the signal to noise ratio. And we do this by combining big data and human curation to improve predictions. So more is definitely not always better and we can learn from pandemics for seasonal now casting. Thank you for your attention and feel free to follow us on social media and to see our other talks in this course. So we are going to talk about how we can use dynamics to probe the function of a network. 
And the main question that I'm trying to answer today is how can we use time instead of space as a key parameter for uh, the multi-scale analysis of a, of a complex network? Uh, to, to do so, we have to face uh, um, a very important challenge, um, what I call problem one. That is uh, about uh, a finding a, a way a problem, um, <clears throat> based on statistical physics uh, to deal with all the interactions that we have inside complex networks, so with the microscopic information, with the minimum loss of that information. A classical approach here is to have uh, start from a network and then extract some descriptors uh, from, from this network. And uh, you can have as many as you want. It can be, for instance, the redistribution or other centralities uh, or the distribution of uh, uh, distances between nodes. Then uh, you put all those information, all that information together by building, for instance, a uh, joint probability uh, distribution. And then you buy to some microscopic function uh, of the network. It can be, for instance, the Shannon entropy, the, the typical information entropy. However, there is a problem <clears throat> with this approach, is that uh, it's incomplete because it focuses only on a few descriptors. And even if you uh, add more descriptors, uh, actually you cannot add so many because at some point the problem becomes intractable because of the many variables that you have in, uh, in your problem. So uh, we have proposed, um, the, the, we have uh, proposed an, another way um, to, to solve the same problem, that is to define uh, a density matrix. Actually, the very first proposal to use a density matrix uh, um, uh, was done by Severini and others, but uh, essentially um, we propose a new uh, way of thinking about this density matrix, that is we can borrow from quantum statistical physics this object, and uh, we calculate for Newman entropy, and it is um, the, the quantum equivalent of Shannon entropy. And um, the density matrix here is defined in terms of an Hamiltonian function and a partition function. But these concepts are difficult to define within the realm of complex networks. So um, our, uh, our proposal a couple of years ago was to um, map uh, the Hamiltonian uh, into uh, the Laplacian, uh, or generally any other function of uh, uh, the adjacency matrix uh, representing the network, and to assume instead of the temperature or the inverse of the temperature, a topological time like uh, uh, parameter for, for the problem. This means that we moved uh, our problem from uh, a thermodynamic perspective to a dynamic perspective, where our density matrix, in fact, is a kind of normalized diffusion propagator. And uh, this choice is uh, winning because it allows us to preserve, for instance, one important feature of the entropy, that is uh, subadditivity. Then, uh, with this choice, uh, uh, we have solved in practice uh, the problem number one because uh, essentially we have uh, um, taken inspiration from quantum mechanics, that is the science of entanglement, to uh, approach uh, the problem that we have in network science. But there, there is much more behind uh, the density matrix. For instance, uh, we have recently shown with uh, Arsham Gavazi, one of my PhD students, that um, uh, the density matrix in, in practice uh, corresponds to the ens an ensemble of information stream operators which in turn define the dynamics of a statistical field. So information here is in practice a statistical field and we have built a theory about it and you can um, learn more from the dedicated talk by Arshan uh, in this conference. And this framework allows us to uh, define a lot of quantities like uh, uh, information divergences or information distances that uh, we have applied in the past and very recently, for instance, to coarse grain uh, multi-layer systems according to their structure or to their function. And you can uh, <clears throat> see also the poster by uh, Arsham uh, in this conference. And as a last application that I want to mention is uh, um, the one to uh, viruses. And uh, we, have, uh, where we have detected essentially the similarities between SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses just by studying how um, uh, the, um, those uh, viruses uh, perturb uh, or are able to perturb the system that is in, in here, the system is the uh, human um, interactome by proteins, 
and uh, um, the, um, each virus here, the interactions between viral proteins and, and, and the human uh, interactome are assumed to build uh, the virus host interactome and we studied this system at different scales. So by using the time-like uh, um, parameter that I have introduced at the very beginning to, to understand the dynamics of the system at different time scales. So thank you for your attention and see the dedicated talk by Sebastiano Bontorin in this conference. Hi everyone, my name is Ludmila Ribeiro and today I'm going to present my work Scaling Patterns in Basic Sanitation Expenditure, the case of Brazil. My work shows a field evidence about the scaling between the infrastructure expenditure and the population size of cities. But at the same time, it can help with solving some social issues like access to sanitation services, which is still a huge challenge in Brazil. Water supply and waste collection are available in the majority of Brazilian uh, municipalities, but there are 100 million people with absolutely no access to any sewage collection in Brazil. As you can see in this figure, the sewage system is still concentrated in the southeast region and in the most urbanized areas. How to explain this, this pattern? Well, uh, let's assume that the size of cities does really matter for sanitation services provision, especially for sewage collection. As a matter of fact, as cities grow in size, one should expect economies of scale in sanitation infrastructure volume and why. Using population and T as the measure of city size at time T, power law scaling for infrastructure takes this form. Economies of scaling in sanitation infrastructure means a decrease in basic sanitation costs, proportional to the city size leading also to respect the power law relationship between the expenditure on sanitation and seed size. How to verify if this power law relationship is valid? Well, it's not exactly easy because there's no single system of funding for sanitation, for basic sanitation in Brazil. The legislation authorizes authorized grant and loan funding from public sources as well as funding from private sources. But I have decided to start using available data from Brazilian federal government databases known as CIOP. CIOP data refers only to grants and aid, which are funds given to municipalities by federal government to run public sanitation projects. My results using radio regression uh, could be grouped in two blocks, initial budget allocation and expenditure commitments. These are budget concepts. Uh, for initial budget allocation, data was found uh, to be roughly 0.62 for municipalities of 2,000 inhabitants, 0 0.93 for municipalities over 20,000 inhabitants, and finally to be 1.15 for municipalities over 50,000 inhabitants. And these are my results for expenditure commitments. Uh, beta was found to be 0 0.43 for municipalities over 2,000, 0 0.58 for municipalities over 20,000, and finally to be 0 0.6 for municipalities over 50,000 inhabitants. So, COP data does not support the idea that the largest municipalities have been receiving funds above their needs. Explain it, observe the pattern. 
So my research should be further expanded in order to include other important funds, such as an employment commitment fund, known as FGTS in Brazilian Portuguese, which is managed by Caixa Econômica Federal, which is a publicly owned bank. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, please send me a message. These are my addresses. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Alej Basolas and today I will be presenting the work Dynamic Segregation and the Disproportionate Incidence of COVID-19 in African-American Communities. This work has been done in collaboration with Sandro Sousa and Vincenzo Nicosia, and we all work at the Queen Mary University of London. The main objective of this work is to answer a rather simple question and is if the ethnic segregation suffered by African-Americans plays any role in today's overrepresentation among the infected and diseased by COVID-19. And in particular, we will focus on the infection gap in several states of the US. The infection gap is shown here in blue bars and is basically obtained, obtaining by doing the difference between the percentage of African Americans among the infected by COVID-19 and the percentage of African Americans among the overall population. The higher this value is, the more hit by the pandemic are African American communities, as it is the case for Michigan or Missouri. The main objective of this work then is to assess if there is a connection between the infection gap and the ethnic segregation suffered by African Americans. And in particular, to measure ethnic segregation, we will use here a methodology based on the movement of random walks in colored graphs. And in particular, through the movement of random walks, we will measure the normalized class mean first passage times tau tilde alpha beta, which can be understood as the time you need to hit an ethnicity beta when you depart from a node of ethnicity alpha. This quantity is, obtaining by doing, is obtained by doing the ratio between tau alpha beta and tau alpha beta null. Here, tau alpha beta is just the average number of steps that you need to hit a class beta when you depart from a class alpha. And tau alpha beta null is, is its counterpart in the null model. The null model is obtained by running a random worker through the same system, so the same city, but in which the classes have been uniformly reshuffled at random. Since this is a ratio with the null model, tau tilde alpha beta is then a pure number, which basically means that when it, when the expected when it is greater than one, it means that the expected time to hit beta is higher than in the null model. And when it is lower than one, it means that the expected time to hit beta is lower than in the null model. This tau tilde alpha beta will provide us with two different types of segregation depending on the network upon which the workers move. And in particular, we will be measuring the residential segregation when the workers move on the adjacency graph. And we will be measuring the dynamical segregation when the workers move on the commuting graph. But let me show you how these normalized class mean first passage times look like in Chicago and Los Angeles. On the top, for the residential segregation, and on the bottom, for the dynamical segregation. On the vertical axis, you have the class of, this, of origin of the worker, and on the horizontal axis, you have the class of destination of the worker. You can see, due to the different values in Chicago and Los Angeles, that ethnic segregation seems more strong in Chicago. But if we compare the residential and dynamical segregation in Chicago, we already observe some significant changes. If we look to these entries, for example, you can see that for an African-American, it is much more easy to reach another African-American when we refer to residential segregation. But when the commuting network is taken into account, this picture changes. For an African-American, it is now much more easy to reach a white individual. This basically means that to have a broader picture of the ethnic segregation in cities, we need to take into account the residential information, but also the mobility information. From these matrices, we have built two different indices, the, ex the clustering index and the exposure indices. And our objective is to assess if this clustering and exposure has any relation with the infection gap. And in particular, here I'm showing you, with the evolution of time, the correlation between the infection gap, gap and each of these two indices. On the x-axis, you have the temporal evolution, and on the vertical axis, you have the R square obtained between each of the metrics and the infection gap. The sign of, of this correlation 
is indicated by the triangles, which basically means that the more, for example, the more clustered African Americans commun African American communities are, higher it is the infection gap. As you can see, the correlations remain high, at least for the beginning of the pandemic, in which no lockdowns or travel restrictions were put in place. Going to the final take-home message, there are two sides of this, of, of this take-home message. We have on the one side, this work shows that the methodology based on the movement of random walks in colored graphs seems pretty useful in terms of quantifying the ethnic segregation in cities. And from a practical perspective, we have shown that this segregation seems to be connected to the infection gap suffered by African-American communities. This work has been done in collaboration with Sandra Sosa and Vincenzo Nicosia, and here you have a few references that might interest you. Hello, my name is Martin Korshay from the Central European University, and I would like to present the recent work of us on interpretable socioeconomic status inference. Our goal in this work was to study socioeconomic segregation in cities, to propose an interpretable deep learning method to identify correlations between socioeconomic status and urban patterns. To do that, we were using three different datasets. One was a satellite image dataset, providing us a 20 centimeter, very high resolution imagery from almost every municipal in Europe. A second dataset was a socioeconomic dataset provided by the Statistical Institute of France, putting a 200 meters time 200 meters grid for the whole territory of the country and assigning socioeconomic indicators like income poverty rate or percentage of real estate owners or renters to each bin. Finally, we used an urban atlas dataset, which for several European municipals, uh, dividing the, their area into polygons and indicating for each polygon its urban function. Is it a road, a natural area, or an industrial area, for example? Through the combination of these three datasets, we attack the first question, where we wanted to define a model to which we give a satellite image as an input, and it is providing us a probability that that given area to which socioeconomic class it belongs to. Actually, we could solve this problem using the efficient net algorithm with uh, quite successfully. In case of Paris, for example, we could find a, a correlation between our observed and our predicted socioeconomic status for each places or each uh, uh, locations about 0.7. If you look at this visually, <clears throat> we can also find it quite appealing that the socioeconomic map, which was actually originally measured by the Statistical Institute from census shown on the left, visually correlates very well with the predicted map, which actually is on the right hand side. Using this um, trained model to infer socioeconomic classes, we wanted to use this to map its activation back to the original images to see which visual information it was using to predict the given classes. So we could actually identify which uh, building or which urban pattern is characterizing poor or rich class prediction by our model. Once this activation was possible using the guided GradCam model, which is a model borrowed from neural imaging, we could correlate these activations with the underly underlying uh, urban polygons provided by the urban atlas dataset. We found that our model is actually identifying very well residential areas, as it is way more overactivated than in the random case. On the other hand, we also found intuitive patterns like richer people live closer to natural areas or green urban areas, or poorer people live closer to industrial areas, roads, or motorways. Consequently, in our work, we provided an efficient inference method of socioeconomic classes from satellite images, which can be used as a cheaper alternative for census in developed countries. And the second step, we provided an interpretable deep learning method, what we use to identify correlations of socioeconomic class with the underlying urban fabric. This work was done in collaboration Pleasure to participate in the Complex 20 conference. I am Zainab Al Alawi, present to you our work titled Studying the Effect of Population Size on the Cooperation and Healthcare System 
as a collaboration work with Dr. Tian Han and Professor Ifang Zhen. Just to give some background of our work that is inspired by the current claim of global recession and the increased need to efficient and sustainable healthcare system. We are motivated to investigate the following challenges. How would the patient's role affect the cooperation behavior of our complex system, namely the healthcare? Studying the effect of different healthcare sector population size, NS, on agents' cooperation behavior in our healthcare model. Just to go back in time, when Florence Nightingale is well-renowned name for her expertise in healthcare management and training from 19th century. She built a good reputation for providing good healthcare services and starting her nursing school in St. Thomas Hospital, London. In recent years, hospital capacity can't cope with the patient's number, especially in winter, in normal situation. With the current pandemic situation, we can observe that healthcare system struggles to cope with the current demands. As we assumed in our constructed model of three finite well mixed population, in our previous work, we utilized the Moron process with natural selection and FX size population. Here in the agent-based modeling simulation, we calculate the average payoff FS for each stated population denotes the payoff that an individual play in a game with a selected strategy profile derives from the state S, where X represents cooperators, agent of public, Y denotes cooperators, agents of private, and Z represent cooperator agents of patient. These payoffs are shown in our healthcare model table in the previous slide. Here we fix the patient population size N3 200 agents and study the effect of increasing providers capacity assuming that are equal first. Example NI uh, N1 sorry and uh, equal N2 and equal NS to meet their demands. On the overall cooperation outcome, we observe that when reputation benefit BR is a small, i.e. the providers do not get enough benefit given their cost as reputation benefit equal cost of investment plus cost of treatment, this increase then increasing NS i.e. trying to meet patient demand magnifies the transition away from cooperation CCC strategy as well as those towards defection DDD. In this study, we explored the influence of reducing the size of healthcare providers population on cooperation between the three populations. We found that the patient is less likely to cooperate small abundance when the provider populations are small, which mean the providers which means the providers have a limited capacity to accommodate the patient's need. To conclude, we found abundance of cooperation closely linked with high benefits to maintain a good cooperation both reputation benefit and patient benefit need to be sufficiently large and patients demand are met. The cooperation and defection frequency are more divergent for larger provider population size. Thank you very much for listening. Hello everyone, I'm Taha Yasu from the School of Sociology at University College Dublin, Ireland. Today I'm going to talk about uh, polarization in social networks. Uh, it is a little bit tricky because I'm going to present you a paper that we recently published in the Journal of Mathematical Sociology. And this paper is my first paper that has no figures in it, and there is no data in the paper either. Uh, 
So um, the challenge of presenting a paper that is entirely based on sociological and mathematical argumentation in five minutes is what I have in front of me. Well, you have to take it from me on many cases, or if you're interested, of course, you can go and check the original math in the paper. Uh, but let me show you first few figures from other people's work. You might be familiar with these figures. They all have the same message, and that is our uh, social networks are very much polarized, at least as long as we can observe on social media platforms. <laughs> The echo chambers have always existed in our societies. Um, these groups of individuals who are like-minded and very well connected, and they are rather isolated from the opposing opinions or people who have opposing opinions. However, it's the first time that using social media data, we can uh, very clearly and nicely illustrate these uh, existing bubbles of like-minded people. Um, the coincidence of observing these echo chambers on social media, combined with the notion of filter bubbles, which relates to the fact that search engines provide you with information that you already expect to see, uh, led to the uh, formation of this opinion that uh, social media are responsible for creation and formation of echo chambers. Uh, and based on that, some authors suggested that um, it is the job of social media platforms to break these bubbles, and they might be able to use uh, opposing or positive algorithmic bias to make people intermix with one another. So in this paper, we are going to investigate uh, this possibility. Before that, let me show you uh, an, an interesting uh, experiment though, in which uh, individuals were exposed to opinions of opposing group, and then their own opinion was measured, and we observe that exposure to opposing views made them more extreme in their own opinion. So Republicans became more Republican when they had to follow a Twitter account for a month that would post democratic views compared to a control Republican group. Um, taking that, we build a model uh, in which uh, we start with a completely mixed population of reds and greens. But whenever we have a green that is surrounded by many reds, uh, there is a higher likelihood with, for this green node to connect to another green. Otherwise, connections and rewirings are at random, with no preference. Uh, you can show that um, this model leads to pure, uh, complete segregation, and um, this is what we expect from a pure homophilic network. However, to have a counteract mechanism, um, based on what is suggested in the literature of the importance of weak ties, we introduce a secondary mechanism. If a node is surrounded by like-minded nodes, but the second, the neighbor of a neighbor, is of opposing opinion, then we give a higher chance for this node to make a connection to that uh, node. Okay, and with the secondary mechanism, we uh, hope to overcome the initial tendency for uh, creating uh, isolated bubbles. Again, when you do the math, you see that uh, even the secondary mechanism would not be able to stop creation of bubbles and echo chambers. Then we came to the last part where we want to see if a positive algorithmic bias could help. Uh, at each step at random, we took two nodes from opposing opinions and make a connection between them on top of the existing homophilic tendency that I introduced earlier. Again, you can show that no matter how much algorithmic bias you introduce, as long as nodes can freely rewire to like-minded no like nodes, um, homophilic um, um, the homophilic bubbles will appear and we will have, again, a uh, complete polarization. In the network. So if I want to summarize, as long as uh, disconnecting and rewiring to like-minded nodes is costless and there is no resistance against it, polarization appears and it's inevitable. And if you look at more successful examples of uh, internet-based or web-based social media platforms, uh, like Wikipedia, you see that uh, the, the fact that people have to work together and they cannot avoid each other simply because the opinions are different is the key to the success of these platforms and the, the main element that um, stops polarization in these examples of most successful social media platforms. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone, I'm Jason Nelson, and I'm here to present our recent work entitled Different Collaboration Patterns and Impact of Chromium Researchers in Europe and North America. 
coalition networks are the networks that scientists establish between them to collaborate in their uh, scientific endeavor. These networks have been widely studied because uh, they affect uh, the scientific output. For instance, um, the team performance is affected by the, the network structure, also the productivity of uh, the scientific team, and even the replicability of the results. Despite the importance of these networks, the, the mechanisms that give uh, the, the shape and the structure of the network has, have not been studied. For instance, cultural, different cultural trends or funding schemes may affect the structure of these networks. In this work, we study the differences in collaboration networks that prominent researchers establish uh, in both North America and Europe. To do so, we study four different fields, namely social inequalities in health, complex networks, metabolomics, and network ecology. We select these fields because they are small enough to assure that uh, co researchers are collaborating between, between them, and also they are mature enough to have a consistent track of uh, publications. Then we focus on the top 100 prominent authors, because prominent authors are always responsible for uh, the majority of the funding available and also the impact that the field produces. We then establish a network of co-authorships with each uh, node corresponding to an author, and they are connected uh, as many times as co-authorships they have. This is another representation of the collaboration network. In this case, the triangles account for European researchers and the circles account for North American ones. We then infer the network with a hierarchical extractive law model and communities corresponding to different roles in the network arise. In this case, each one of the colors represents one of the communities found in the, with the block model. When looking at the composition of these communities or groups, we found that they are highly polarized, meaning that uh, they are all, almost uh, majority European or majority North American ones. Then this uh, polarization is significant when compared with the normal hypothesis where uh, authors are allocated at random in groups. Also, when looking at the behavior of these groups, we observe how the groups with a major fraction of European researchers have uh, more connections in both uh, within the group and with other groups. Then, quantify these differences in connectivity, we establish some metrics over the network itself. For instance, in this case, we first measure uh, the number, the total number of collaborations. In this case, uh, the vertical lines account for the means of the distributions, and we observe how uh, European researchers are significantly shifted towards higher values of uh, collaborations. We then establish a second metric, the fraction of intracontinental collaborators, that accounts for the, the fraction of collaborators of the same continent that an author is connected with. For instance, if a European is connected with half of the total number of Europeans, this uh, number will be um, 0.5. And then Europeans are significantly shifted toward higher values. This happens with, uh, within all the four fields under the study. Europeans uh, tend to be uh, more connected. Then, uh, when we look at the influence that this may have uh, on impact, uh, measuring the impact as the, the number of uh, citations, uh, in this case, um, when publishing alone, North American researchers have a higher impact and, than European, and when publishing with other PRs within the field, uh, they, the, this gap in, is closed. Despite uh, both uh, of, uh, of um, North American and European researchers increase the impact when collaborating. This is repeated for all different fields. This increase in with, when collaborating and Europeans closing this, uh, this gap. Mm, to summarize, uh, we found that North American and Europe-based researchers present different collaborative behaviors. European prominent researchers collaborate more often with other prominent researchers than North American and when publishing with other PR, uh, North America and based the researchers have higher impact than Europeans, but collaborating Europeans reduce the, this 